And certainly as a result of that, the change of technology, the job landscape is changing. And newer jobs are emerging. There are jobs which, when I started my career, which are very, very uh, uh, common. You did, don't even hear about them. An example called stenographer and a typist. Where are they? They're not there. They used to be very famous. I used to run an EDP, EDP center for a multinational called Bosch in the early 80s. I used to have an army of what they were called data entry operators. Where are they? They're gone. And certainly the new jobs are appearing at this point of time. What are these new jobs? We never heard about cyber security specialists. We never heard about data scientists. There are people who are AI analysts. More importantly, you see one other trend. And that trend is, there is multidisciplinary nature in terms of our requirements from the industry. What are these? You look at an automobile engineer. In some ways, you know, it becomes uh, interchangeable between the word called mechanical engineer. I'm one by training. I'm a mechanical engineer. Proudly, I keep telling people. What did I learn? Learned, learned a lot about IC engines. Cardinal cycle, auto cycle, enthalpy, entropy. And you look at what is on today in the EV marketplace. The transition that we're seeing. An automobile engineer requires as much as mechanical engineering knowledge as is electrical, electronics, software, sensors, and so on. So one change that we can't stop, which is making these jobs disappear, is technology. Whereas the European countries are aging at this point of time, the profile of the worker has to change. So the result is jobs are changing. So jobs in India will also change. You look at jobs that change because of the economic impact that keeps brought in by COVID. We started working from home. We started this new breed of engineers, breed of jobs called the gig economy, where part-timers can work for many people. A third one is that we're also seeing shifting in uh, uh, industry demands. How many of us have paid in, in uh, how many of us have paid uh, and if you want to compare it with um, Apple, which is the one very popular one, Apple took 44 days before they got their 1 million users, or Facebook took as many as 10 months before they got their 1 million users. And what is ChatGPT doing right now is in 5 months, they got 100 million users. It's a reflection of pace of technology, the trifecta of user usage and the developer, if you look at that. That's what the combination of that is giving these results. I think the people think what was popular before uh, chat GPT was TikTok. TikTok took nine months, twice the time, to get to 100 million users. The first company that we know in the universe that hit $2 billion of revenue in the first 12 months after the launch. That's what we see as the technology influence all around. So what do we need to do? Two things I'll call out. One is what is the skills that we require in our students as we move forward with this complete juggernaut of change that I've been describing to you. Number one is that we need to start engaging our students to get into the mode of thinking. They should get into critical thinking, creative thinking, design thinking. They can't, they can't live in this world, trust me, with our rote learning methodologies. So therefore, one expectation I have is that we should definitely move in terms of ability for people to think, analyze, and then solve problems. It can't be, I read it in the textbook, I want it back on a piece of paper for all of you. The second one is, what is there on the screen too, is all about adaptability. Adaptability because we think there's so much amount of change that is happening at this point of time. 
people have to adapt to new technologies and new skills as quickly as possible. And that has to be a mind shift, mindset shift to ensure that it becomes a reality. And the third one which we have to make people understand is that learning is not going to be one time. It's the past. You got a degree and you said, you know, degree is good enough for me. I can uh, live my life thereafter. It's not true any longer. The world is all towards micro degrees, certificates. As you change it, I don't, I, I'm a strong believer you don't think, need them either. I strongly believe in it. I think we probably, I don't know whether it will happen in my generation, but it will probably happen in the, your generation, where people say, what's use of degrees? Let's understand what your passion is. What are your skills you have? I'll show you what I have as a job of mine. If you match between them, you got the job. You continue to be productive. You continue to be innovative. You continue to create value for my organization. You'll be with me. Otherwise, you find a job and I find a new guy. So therefore, I think it becomes very important to ensure that our children start learning the uh, art of lifelong learning. Their mindset has to be there. I think it's a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which says that I eat as if I live for, uh, I die tonight, sorry. I eat as if I die tonight, but I learn as if I will live forever. So that's what I think my expectations are. The three things is critical thinking, thank you, adaptability, and lifelong learning. So what are the interventions that you require to do? Conscious of the time, I'll finish off. I think very consistent with uh, Dr. Jagdish Kumar. The first and the foremost, he said, and I'm aligned to what he said, and I think it's a crying need at this point of time. I didn't have a conversation with him too when I went to see him in the recent past is all about faculty development. I think the key is in faculty. There's a very um, uh, popular Chinese proverb which says, don't give me fish, don't give me fishing rod, give, learn, teach me how to make the fishing rod. The teacher is the teacher. So therefore, what we need is the upgradation of skills of teachers. That, I think, is a Herculean task. Rightly so, Dr. Jagishman pointed out about NEP 2020 has many of these elements which are certainly there. The second one that I feel, and my headline news all the time, my headline for some of these speeches, is that the future is all about student-centric experiential learning. So the teacher has to become student-centric. It is not anymore learning is teacher-centric. It was true in my generation. One teacher, one class, if I miss something from him, I don't have a resource anywhere else. Now you have several alternatives. You can learn anytime, anywhere. So therefore, the teacher responsibility is to ensure it becomes student-centric. And the student has changed too. There's enough of evidence at this point of time to say in 12 minutes they lose attention if you don't engage them. So if you say that, you know, look, I will give one speech for 50 minutes, 55 minutes, and then clap and say, the finished class is done, the guy learned nothing. He says, this is the most boredom stuff. I've seen, I teach too. I'm not teaching so much as I used to do, but I teach. 12 minutes, I can clearly see people slowly, sheepishly, removing their cell phones, texting if the class is not interesting. If the class is interesting, you never lose the attention of the child. So therefore, the second one is bring the focus onto the student. And a third one that I'll call out is experiential learning. We need to have this hands-on learning of people. Uh, i like to congratulate the Telangana government which announced the Skill University yesterday. But I think what is future is that it is not just the skill which is take us to pieces. It has to be the traditional education plus skills will be equal to knowledge. It cannot be just skills will do the job or just knowledge will do the job. 
it has to be a combination of them. And I think, again, Dr. Jayesh Kumar wrote a very nice article uh, over the weekend. He was kind enough to send it across to me. He writes very frequently. Please follow him on the Twitter and all newspapers. Very well done. He talked about this apprenticeship programs, which is an announced as part of the budget too. And what is what is that we want to do there is making sure that there, there is, he talked about NAPS. Sir, I've been a very strong advocate of NAPS so far. In uh, NASCOM, which is IT industry, we have about 150,000 apprentices at this point of time. But I think we need to think through this scheme of current, what has been announced. Because if you do the math of 500 companies uh, and uh, five years, one crore, it works out to be a staggering number of, you need to train 4,000 of them, which I think we need to think through these a little more carefully. But certainly, I think experiential learning, hands-on is something which is important which I think we need to place uh, our students towards. We also, uh, the part of that is getting professors of practice. The fourth one I'll call out is all about flexibility in terms of learning. We, I think uh, we need to do a lot more of it. There's one which I think I'll call out is we implemented something called fractals in the IIT system. So you have a course of heat transfer or four credits. You can break it up into one, two, three, four, and the student can just take off. He can discontinue that course after he finishes whatever he likes. He or she likes, he, it's of interest to them, they continue. Otherwise, they don't. So I think we have to give that enormous amount of flexibility to the student to say, learn what you are passionate about. So therefore, why are we saying, you know, 100% of the courses are to be in core? No, we said, no, no, it's ready the higher education institutions are concerned. We are happy that both are here and we have colleagues from industries, Chitendra Kumar and my friend Professor Sudhakar Raugar and Prabhakar Raugar. I also have my colleagues of Professor Mahindra Sar is here, Professor Venkat Ramana, Professor Siram Venkatesh, Professor Aparav sir, and so many distinguished personalities are in the in the meeting. The meeting is industry wise for policy change in the context of education. It is an industry have a wise. What they have wise, their wise is to send your students for the industry who will have the skills, who will have the knowledge, who will have the adaptability, who will have the multidisciplinary approach, who will have the knowledge ecosystem to adapt in the industry circumstances. So that's why the industries have voice for the policy change and it is a right time and it is a continuous process. The change is a constant. We are all know that every time we have to change according to the needs, according to the requirement, according to the changes around us. So the change is a constant and reforms continues to be done. When we admit the students, the students have a lot of aspirations and every student wants success. Every student wants success. Those things particularly higher education institutions, they want success. And their parents also expect from the academic institutions, definitely the institutions will shape our children to become employable, to become knowledgeable, and definitely they will become a great citizens of this country. So definitely, as Professor Jayesh Kumar Garu and Mohan Edgaru said, this is a student-centric learning. When you look into the, a democratic country, the whole policies moves around citizens. When you look into the, a capitalist country or capitalists, they look into the, a consumer-centric thinking. The leader at PwC. Please welcome him with a big round of applause, everyone.
good morning everyone and a very great listening to the dignitaries on the stage i think they have a very valid viewpoint from the industry perspective and from academic perspective <clears throat> fortunately unfortunately i'm not an academician neither is the system from a process capacity and learning from each other perspective and that is what i wanted to present today uh, we've done a paper which will be released in just a little while on the status of education in telangana we're covering both school education and higher education and to try to identify so telangana as a state you know it's it's the youngest state in the country uh, sorry can we have the presentation yeah the presentation the report sorry so telangana is the youngest state in the country we all know and it's done great strides in the last 11 years of its 10 years of its existence right 10 years back the gr of telangana especially in the school education lagged behind the national average it was way behind the other south indian states today it's far ahead of that you know you, you've done well in reaching that stage it's it's a fairly young population you know 40% of the population is under the age of 25 these are people who would be interested in education you know in all parameters in terms of economy in terms of economic growth telangana has done well you know better than the national average in in most cases right uh, however you know where do we lack you know one of the questions or topics which were given to us was what should be the vision for telangana education system right do we have an answer in the report view with some of the view points that we could think of you know can we look at when we look at people like australia when we look at states like karnataka which are states right next to you a large part of the gdp and the economy itself is driven by education in fact australia there was this one report which said education is the third largest sector of the economy purely by the revenues generated education in india is a public good we are not looking at the revenue generated directly by the fees paid by the students but what it does help is australia another report mentioned that almost 30% of the tourism revenue happened because of the education sector so you get one student admitted to australia you have people their relatives their friends traveling to australia to meet over the next four year period so can we look at education as a sector which gives a certain percentage of the economic growth it could be driven by the inbound students from other states it could be revenue from there it could be the research outcomes today the industry and the academia are working in silos the industries do need solutions to problems the academia is looking at research progress can the two of them work together to build a multiplier effect with their research it could be in terms of incubations and jobs created at the universities so there's a direct impact on the economy and in my view that should be the vision for the higher education system the other part again you know there are universities in the world where the stated goal of the university you know i could speak about university of new south wales in australia where the vision is to have five nobel laureates from the university over the next 30 years and do that a state like meghalaya which is far away in the east they have created a central csr cell to get csr funding from the industry under the finance department of the state not in academics but they source all the csr fundings and give it out to the departments telangana has much more industry for an example to look at finally from the state government level i think we will have to look at competitive grants the grants need to be some you know you will need to give grants to the universities but at the same time you need to support universities which are doing better which are showing the vision and the implementation of the issue you should look at ppp you should look at more funds coming to higher education i think it is important to get teachers recruited quickly to some of the best universities there was a report very recently in the newspaper that osmania and kakatiya the two largest state universities have 70% vacancies of academic staff that is not something which is sustainable you just offering a degree to the student without engaging the student with good teachers 
right? And building the capability of the teachers is important. So that's, you know, um, this in a nutshell is what we have tried to study through our report. We've created certain, we've given certain examples of how these could be done. And we would be happy to, you know, work. Thank you, Professor V. Women of Telangana Council of Higher Education and Vice Chancellor at Rajiv Gandhi University of Knowledge Technologies, Pasar, Government of Telangana. Anurag Pallagaru, the Director and Operations and Strategy at Digital Learning at Anurag University. Can you put your hands together for Mr. Anurag Pallagaru? So audience, we have a special guest. We'd like you to put your hands together to welcome Ms. A. Sri Devasena Garu, IAS Commissioner Tech and Collegiate Education. Next, we would like to call upon Professor J. Mahinder Reddy Garu, Distinguished Advisor at ICFI Society. So we request Mr. Fanny Garu to kindly join us on the dais, please. And now it's time for the release of report. I request all our dignitaries to kindly take a step forward and please move uh, forward to the table so that we can have a clear and a visible release of the report. All this while this report has lots of hard work behind it. The making this conference is so beautiful and so successful. Congratulations to Fiki and WVC for the release of Congratulations Fiki and PWC for the release of report. Can we all put our hands together and congratulate louder? Sorry for the change, audience. There's a small change. We would first request Ms. Sri Devasena Garu, IAS, to kindly step forward and address the audience. Can I put our hands together to welcome her here? Thank you. Good morning to all the dignitaries on the not uh, equipped to comment much on the proceedings, but then uh, when we saw the book that has just been released, I was just telling uh, the organizers here that you seem to have brought the horoscope of uh, the education department into our hands. Now it's up to us what we do with it. Kundli milana hai, ne milana hai. So we'll have to look into that. Uh, in the college and technical education uh, that days have arrived for this department. For the reason that None less than the Chief Minister is heading this department today. And in no uncertain terms, he has told us that he intends making a change. And that is visible as you can see. Today itself, we have a huge program at the LB Stadium, where around 50,000 teachers of the school is directed. And these are teachers who have got promotions after a period of some 10 to 12 years. So the first thing um, this government has decided, which is really so welcome, is you can't make people run like horses without giving them a pat on the back. And that is the pat on the back they receive in terms of their promotions this year. And uh, so now uh, what we call in Telugu is Disha uh, the CM is going to tell the teachers what is going to be their priority and how he engineering colleges especially. I can see Pallana so happy to see him and yeah. 
So uh, one is that we seem to have had a plethora of colleges that have suddenly come up with the AICT giving them yes. On behalf of the FIKI Telangana Education Committee, first of all, let me start with the keynote speakers. We have, we are very fortunate to have the great illuminaries of this country today. One is from academics, another one is from the industry. So, uh, Professor Jagdish Kumar Garu, Chairman UGC, has clearly emphasized the challenges and the aspirations that are there in the country with the young generation now and linking them with the sustainable development and inclusive growth of the economy. Sir, your focus on NEP, outcome-based education is actually one of the uh, themes of this uh, conference and also you have highlighted the role of the online education in the present uh, scenario of the higher education in the country. Taking this opportunity, I would like to mention that I, I am from University of Hyderabad and the University of Hyderabad is the first university in the country which has come up with, all, which has adopted online education policy. And sir, five years back we have submitted a detailed proposal to the Ministry of Education to set up Institute of Digital Learning Studies, Research and Training. So this proposal is still pending with the Ministry and now just I got the idea it's come to my mind that this institution now can be ownership. I request you to please consider this once again. And uh, this was done uh, then under the leadership of our my ex-boss, uh, Professor Apparao Garu. We both of us made presentation in the ministry also. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And of course, as it was said by Limbadri Garu that now Professor Jagdish Kumar Garu is a man of uh, reforms and his innovative approach within the framework of NEP 2000, new NEP policy is actually changing the landscape, uh, higher education landscape of this country. Sir, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. To the, I will come to the, the, the great person of the industry who does not require any introduction. Uh, he is the person in who we find both industry and academics. So it is a rare combination that he always transfers his rich experience from the industry into academics and from the academics into the industry. And it is always interesting to, to, to listen to him. And thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And, and, and your focus on adaptability of technology, adaptability to technology and continuous learning. I think he is the person who continuously learns. So that, that's why he, he, he focused on continuous learning. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Then uh, we have with the, we had with us Professor Limbadri Garu, who actually the person of higher education in the state of Telangana. We know that he is very innovative and active in implementing NEP in Telangana. Sir, thank you very much. Suchindra Kumar Garu, who actually said that he is not an academician, but he made a very academic presentation. So, so thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Then we had Sridevi Senagaru, who joined us, so for, for, despite and of course, busy schedule being uh, working in school education and uh, and uh, and uh, also uh, giving us the the present status of engineering in Telangana. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for joining us. And last but not least, I also thank Sudhakar Rao Garu for uh, see for telling us in detail 
the objectives and uh, of, of this meeting and i once again thank all academicians distinguished academicians distinguished guests and representatives of the industry press each and every one for making this program success thank you very much conference so now we are moving forward for a quick 10 minutes short break we request everyone to adhere to the timing so that we can catch up with the schedule thank you so much all the dignitaries for their valuable time and making your presence here thank you so far uh, you know what asc is doing for the end beneficiary that is a child but unfortunately with all the you know facilities and with all the cases and uh, the asc stipulations for training the actually the faculty the train the trainer okay the we see a lot of uh, you know especially in the higher education space uh, specifically in the generic college segment the openness to learn for the faculty in spite of their trying to fund it bring the best brains and do the training is taking a hit any suggestions how we can go about it or uh, you know sd has put in over there and we also use the cesers etc everything but still this has become a big challenge because this is where the actual serviceability of whatever we are talking about design thinking or whatever we are talking about innovation or entrepreneurship is actually not trickling to the end user that is the child the major what i see is a major thing that sir uh, you know gap that sir uh, you know i i thank you deserving this actually the professor senior professor are not changing but today please understand i gave an example of how of what speed ai is taken a role of a poet musician and a artist role and also even cracking jee these machines will do much faster than the human beings so in such a speed if you don't change you will become irrelevant that is what has happened today our teachers they become irrelevant so we need to do something forcibly i think many of you have to forcibly tell them that they have to do some upgradation courses to continuous learning is not just for them today but for all of us so thanks to nep continuous learning okay and personal learning is also very important that means you need to learn yourself rather than looking for every time a teacher so these are some of the things a new order I don't think there is any choice for any of us But today. In that speed at which we are going, all of us have to accommodate, learn. Otherwise, we'll become irrelevant and then say, "Sir, I, I got an email from one of my PhD student from IAC. Sir, I'm not getting job." I said, "You, you have to, you have to change yourself." <laughs> See, one example giving is not a good idea. Why I'm telling you is, if you look at the companies like IBM alone. I in 200,000 engineers in India in one city, and similarly I can give you 2,000 companies. I in large number of engineers. So there may be a crunch of jobs. I'm not denying that totally, but there are a lot of opportunities also. I think we need to connect them together, and we need to upgrade ourselves. Upskill, reskilling is order of the day, and luckily the technology has given that option to learn yourself at your time in your home. i think we have to relearn our habits make completely new habits instead of just looking at some books really we have to take some courses which are online free okay sit down go through the exam rigorously pass that everybody has to become a student as well there should not be education i told you one statement that not knowing should be a strength once we accept that i do not know is my strength you will definitely be successful thank you good afternoon